Uh, I do want to begin, as Zach said, by talking about what is expositional preaching. Um, and I have four questions uh, that I want to consider about preaching and sermons. Uh, question number one, I think it's an appropriate place for us to begin this time together. Why do we need preaching? Why do we need preaching? Some people today are asking, is preaching necessary for a Christian church? Is the monologue of one person addressing a host of others who are maybe completely silent, at least comparatively silent to the one who's speaking, is that encouraging to faith in this very active participant age that we live in? We seem to shorten our attention span with every advance in technology. Uh, Some of you will have a hard time sitting and listening for 45 minutes because you have a cell phone there. And there are other things you could do while you're listening. Is today really an appropriate time in history for preaching? You know, some people see a monologue like preaching as nothing other than the echo of some larger intellectual or cultural boogeyman, the Enlightenment, or logocentrism, or Hellenistic thinking, or the hegemony of the powerful over the weak. I could go on and on. People, critics, say, wouldn't it be better for us to have a kind of postmodern, humble, multicultural, sort of both-and participation, uh, even kind of sharing, really, instead of a sermon, more like a kind of updated Quakerism or, or brethrenism? Well, certainly congregational participation is important in preaching. Uh, a sermon preached to no one is not preaching. Congregations must be involved in listening, in reflecting, in evaluating, in applying, and I don't mind when they're also involved in encouraging while the preaching is going on. Thank you. They may sometimes share some of their evaluations during the sermon like you brothers just did. But the sermon as a monologue with one person speaking and others sitting there with their mouths closed and their ears open, I think is an accurate and a powerful symbol of our spiritual state. One person speaking God's Word, reading it, explaining it, illustrating it, applying it for the benefit of the hearers, is a depiction of God's self-disclosure and of our salvation being a gift. We contribute nothing to it. Whenever God speaks in love to man, it is an act of grace. We do not deserve it. We have not earned it. Just think of the first sermon we have recorded in the New Testament. Picture it in the book of Acts. It's an arresting illustration of this. This was not a humanly planned meeting. The context was a crowd in Jerusalem, among whom were the disciples. God had poured out His Spirit in an amazing way, signaling His special work. Now, to reflect on it theologically, since we're at a seminary, that work there at Pentecost was a work of salvation and redemption as his church was being formed as the kind of anti-Babel against all the division and ethnic segregation. But at the same time, it was also an act of judgment. You know, as speaking of strange tongues was coming among his people as if they were foreign invaders, like we hear them being talked about in the prophets. But that's to sort of go off theologically reflecting on Pentecost. Anyway, Peter, Peter addresses the crowd And he cites, I assume from memory, portions of Joel and Psalm 16 and Psalm 110, and he explains them. He begins with the passage from Joel, which just explains what they were seeing around them. But then he moved to these two Psalms, which he knew drew their attention to the recently crucified and resurrected Jesus. While he was interrupted at the end with that famous question, what shall we do? For some time, we don't know how long, Peter simply spoke to the crowd. He preached a message to them that they had not known 
and they would not have otherwise known if he had not spoken to them. Jesus himself, when he was with them, had taught them, but the people didn't seem to understand. Peter himself had not understood Jesus' identity. Until there in Matthew 16, it was revealed to him, Jesus says, by my Father. This is always the way it is with Christian preaching. The empty pulpit in many of our church buildings well displays the spiritual reality. We stand empty, waiting to be filled by God's Spirit as He comes to His people by His Word. You see, friends, friends, in preaching, we have an important symbol left in the midst of our congregation that we are created by hearing God's Word. As surely as the worlds were called into being by the Word of God, as surely as Abram was called to God by the Word of His promise addressing Him, so too we Christians are made Christians by believing God in His Word, by trusting His promise, by having faith. And that faith, Paul says in Romans 10, comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. Think of it through preaching. All that we we see and show and exhibit and demonstrate, that there is only one God. That this God is relational and a communicating being. That this God speaks to us that this God has initiated his relationship with us, that this God continues to instruct us by his spirit through his word understood in the context of his church, that he uses those gifted, called, and recognized to teach us his word, that we must come in utter humility entirely dependent upon him. All of this and more is symbolized by the preaching of God's word being at the center of his congregation. In his German Mass of 1526, Martin Luther declared that the preaching and teaching of God's Word is the greatest and noblest part of any service. Martin Lloyd-Jones observed, Is it not clear as you take a bird's eye view of church history that the decadent periods and eras in the history of the church have always been those periods when preaching had declined? What is it that always heralds the dawn of a reformation or of a revival? It is renewed preaching. Not only a new interest in preaching, but a new kind of preaching. A revival of true preaching has always heralded these great movements in the history of the church. And of course, when the reformation and the revival come, they have always led to great and notable periods of the greatest preaching that the church has ever known. As that was true in the beginning, as described in the book of Acts, it was also true after the Protestant Reformation, Luther, Calvin, Knox, Latimer, Ridley, all these men were great preachers. In the 17th century, he had exactly the same thing, the great Puritan preachers and others. And in the 18th century, Jonathan Edwards, Whitfield, the Wesleys, Rollins, and Harris were all great preachers. It was an era of great preaching. Whenever you get Reformation and revival, this is always and inevitably the result. Friends, the purpose of this time together, really in all six of our talks and our panels, is to think carefully about what we should do when we preach. So my second question, what kind of preaching do we need? Specifically, we all want to encourage expositional preaching. One of the most fundamental marks of a healthy church is a church centered around the exposition, the expounding of God's Word to God's people. Now, as soon as you say expositional preaching, people have all kinds of ideas and many misconceptions, really. Some people think that any sermon in which the Bible is opened is an expositional sermon. Well, that's not true. Uh, I open the Bible when I preach topically, but I would say it's a topical sermon. I've, I've assembled various passages on a particular interested topic, a subject, a, like a systematic theology meditation. That's not an expositional sermon. Uh, some people may think it's just simply a verse-by-verse sermon, as if the only way one could do expositional preaching is verse-by-verse. Verse. 
But I don't think that's true. I think there are a number of different legitimate ways you can do expositional preaching, depending on the genre you're working with, the, the type of scripture. Uh, some people assume when you say expositional preaching, you mean dry and luxury preaching. <clears throat> well, I leave that to you. I think the, the Word of God should be applied and should be applied thoroughly. When I say expositional ser- an expositional sermon, I mean a sermon on a portion of Scripture in which the point of the passage is the point of the message. A sermon on a portion of Scripture in which the point of the passage determines and is the point of the message. And that would be true in all expositional sermons. Now, having said that, all truly expositional sermons will not sound the same. All, All of my sermons don't sound the same. So in this coming week, Lord willing, I intend to preach one sermon uh, as an overview of the book of Obadiah. Uh, And I plan to preach another passage from Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16, on just four verses. Well, those two sermons won't sound alike. It's very different preaching a, a long passage and a short passage. But there's the same purpose in it all, to hear and to heed God's Word as opposed to just our own made-up stories and wisdom. Again, in the 1526 German Mass of Martin Luther, he worried that, quote, if incompetent preachers had no homiletical direction, everyone will preach what he wills. And instead of the gospel and its exposition, they will be preaching again about blue ducks. Whenever Luther wants to show the absurdity of the kind of preaching that goes on when people don't preach the Bible, he just says, they preach about blue ducks, because medieval preachers would often just take local legends and weave stories around them, kind of like what a lot of preachers do today with the latest business book they've read. Number three, why is expositional preaching best? Why is expositional preaching best? Well, it's what we see in the Bible. Not only is there Peter's Pentecost sermon, the first Christian sermon, but there is more to suggest this in the New Testament. The most extended treatment in the New Testament of what the Christian gathering should be like is found where? Where is the most extended passage in the New Testament about what the Christian gathering should be like? 1 Corinthians what? 11 to 14. Yeah, if you look in chapters 11 to 14 of 1 Corinthians, And there what you see, Paul's concern is well summarized in chapter 14, verse 26, when he says, all of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If you look throughout those chapters, that is Paul's standard for deciding what should be done in the congregation's meeting. Well, it follows then that such a standard of usefulness and edification should especially be applied to that which we have said is central to the Christian congregation, preaching. Okay, what preaching will most tend to the edifying of the saints? And the answer must certainly be teaching which exposes God's Word to God's people. Do you have any doubt that expositional preaching should be the basic diet of preaching in your congregation? Friend, just remember, when, when God gave Moses instructions... For the kings that would surely come in Israel. Do you remember in Deuteronomy 17 what those kings were supposed to do? We read, when, this is in Deuteronomy 17, verse 18, when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the priests who are Levites. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his brothers and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Such a practice is consistent with the priority of God's word. Remember what marks the righteous man in Psalm 1? His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. This delight is echoed in stanza after stanza of the great 119th Psalm. Seven times a day, I praise you for your righteous laws. I obey your statutes for I love them greatly. Your law is my delight. 
Well, friends, given that delight in God's word, delivering that very word is to be the wonderful burden of Christian preaching. Furthermore, given the fact that we live in a literate age where the printed word, both on the page and electronically on our phones, is familiar, familiar to all of us, where God's word has been chapterized and versified and translated and made readily available, why would we not take advantage of that in our preaching? Earlier ministers, when preachers had few of these advantages, Chrysostom, Augustine, others, preached consecutive series of sermons through portions of Scripture. So in his third sermon on the rich man and Lazarus, Chrysostom said, I often tell you many days in advance the subject of what I'm going to say in order that you may take up the book in the intervening days, go over the whole passage, learn both what is said and what is left out, and so make your understanding more ready to learn when you hear what I will say afterwards. Well, friends, in such a commitment to bring his people God's word, Chrysostom was following in the footsteps of Moses, whom Jethro charged with teaching the people the law. Remember also in Exodus 24, and in 2 Chronicles 17, Jehoshaphat and his, sent his officials and the Levites out. Quote, they taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went about through all the cities of Judah and taught among the people. This is just what Moses had said the Levites were to do. In Deuteronomy 33, they shall teach Jacob your rules and Israel your law. So you see, Chrysostom, in trying to teach his people the word of God, he was following the steps of Josiah who we read in 2 Chronicles 34, read in the people's hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the temple of the Lord. He was following the steps of Ezra and the returning Levites who we read read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Nehemiah 8.8. Friends, this pattern of teaching of God's word being central to the gathering of God's people continued into the time of Christ. So the synagogues of Jesus' day would read through the scriptures and lectionary cycles over three years. Now the Babylonian synagogues tended to do it with selected passages in just one year, but in the Palestinian uh, area we think it was a three-year, from remnants that we have, it's a three-year cycle of going through the scriptures. So they would read the passage for the day and then comments would be made just like we see Jesus doing in Luke chapter 4 when he's in the synagogue at Nazareth. Now, exactly how much the first churches were modeled after the synagogue meetings of the time is impossible to determine. That's why if you want to do a PhD, it's a great topic for you to take up because we have no idea and we can't know without more sources being found. So you can kind of say whatever you want. Nevertheless, the expositional series that survived from Chrysostom and other even earlier Christian preachers suggest that this consecutive expositional pattern was widespread. The sermons or the summaries of sermons we have in the New Testament are few in number. They show a concern to be relevant, definitely, but more fundamentally to be rooted in the Scriptures. Now, of course, the early Christians lacked some of our advantages, like having the text of Scripture available to them to be examined even while the sermon is being preached. So the mechanics of expositional preaching in the first century would more often rely on mnemonic devices like repetition or memory. But like we said about Peter's sermon at Pentecost, that sermon seems to have been substantially a meditation on, an exposition of, an application of portions of Joel 2 and Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. Another example of this in the New Testament would be the book of Hebrews, where if you look in the book of Hebrews, you look in chapters 3 and 4, he's basically expounding Psalm 95, or you go to chapter 7, again, it's Psalm 110 that he's turning to. So in in all of this, we can see that while it is good to preach the truth, it is even better to preach the truth in such a way that people can see where they can get the truth. The word was to have free course in the church, as Luther said, because by it, we torment Satan. I love what Hughes Olds has said of John MacArthur's expository preaching. Here is a preacher who has nothing in the way of a winning personality, good looks, or charm. 
what he seems to have is a witness to true authority. He recognizes the scripture in the scripture, the word of God. And when he preaches, it is scripture that one hears. It is not the words of John MacArthur that are so interesting as it is that the word of God is of surpassing interest. That is why one listens. Of course, expositional preaching is the only way to make the word of God central in our life together. So in our congregation back in D.C., uh, the word is brought forward in all of our meetings in different ways. When we gather on Wednesday night, we gather for an inductive Bible study. We'll take a short portion of scripture and we will work through it for one hour where I'll pose a question to the congregations gathered. They'll give me answers. Then I'll ask another question. So we might work through up on a whiteboard three or four verses so that people will both understand 2 Corinthians chapter 8, but they'll also be learning in that how to understand the Bible. On Sunday night, we'll have a brief sermon given, just about 15 minutes long, from the opposite testament of Scripture as the morning sermon had been on. So if the morning sermon is from the book of Romans chapter 3, as it was this past Sunday morning, uh, the evening sermon was from Psalm 14, verses 1 to 3, that Paul quotes in that section of Romans 3. So every Lord's Day, the people are getting a balanced combination of understanding both the New Testament and the Old Testament and seeing how those go together. We have in the sort of Sunday school hour before our main meeting what we call core seminars. Uh, all of our core seminar material is available online. You can download it for free. You can rip it off, change it. You don't have to give us credit. You can do whatever you want. If it serves you, just go capbap.org core seminars. And we got core seminars on lots of stuff. But we try to teach scripture. We have an Old Testament class and a New Testament class where we go through every book in the Bible. <clears throat> but especially as a congregation, we feast on God's word around the dinner table of the Sunday morning sermon. That is our church's main meal. Uh, the main sermon this last Sunday was an hour long. We were in Romans chapter 3, verses 9 to 18. <clears throat> and it's, it's just an utter joy. It is the center of our congregation's life together. There, there is, before the sermon is preached, a palpable sense of expectation. And it's not because I'm the preacher. I'm only a preacher about half the time. Uh, it might be Blake preaching. Uh, it might be Zach Schlegel preaching. But whoever we have in the pulpit that day, the congregation knows they will be bringing to us God's word. So we have a few moments of quietness before the sermon. The preacher comes up. And in that time of quietness, you can feel the anticipation. When the preacher announces a text, the, the rustling of the leaves is gigantic and heartening. And we spend an hour just feasting on God's word. That's one of the reasons that, no, no offense to, to brothers who have multiple services in your church, but I just, when I go preach at churches like that, I don't know how you do it. You know, I, I, I preach at one friend's church in Arizona, they have five services. I preach the same sermon five times in a row. And all I can say is that's just very different than what I do at my church. We preach once. I feel like, if any of you know World War II history, I feel like Jimmy Doolittle in his raid. You know, I don't leave anything. I mean, I give everything I've got, then I crash land in China. You know, it just, <laughs> when, when I preach, I'm just giving it everything. And the idea of doing that a second time is utterly impossible. I could preach a second message by just be doing two completely different things. I'd have to hold back a lot in order to do it. That is our main time together as a church. That's at the center of our life together. Question number four, so how do you decide what to preach on? Because this is really what makes expositional preaching in some ways expositional preaching. It's how, how do you be driven by the word very practically? Brothers, my basic advice to you here is you want to preach through the Bible. You want to preach through the Bible. John Alasco, the reformer, encouraged, encouraged the serial exposition of Scripture. That's not Scripture on a breakfast food, C-E-R-E-A-L. It's the serial, S-E-R-I-E-L. It's the in order, working through, or in a series, working through Scripture. So John Calvin, you know, was banished from Geneva, and when he was called back from Strasbourg a few years later, he picked up right where he had left off in his expositional series. <clears throat> he said, I resumed the exposition at the place where I stopped. By doing so, I showed that I had been interrupted for a time. 
This commitment to preach serially consecutively through the books of the Bible helped make the Reformation perhaps the greatest movement of public education about the Bible in the history of the church. At the parish church in Wittenberg, where Luther was, there were three public services on Sunday. From And these are not like you could go to whichever one you wanted. No, 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 no. These were three public gatherings of the congregation on Sunday. From five to six in the morning on the Pauline epistles, from nine to 10 on the gospels, in the afternoons at a variable hour, depending on when the sun's going down, on a continuation of the theme of the morning or on the catechism. The church was not locked during the week, but on Mondays and Tuesdays, there were sermons on the catechisms, Wednesdays on the Gospel of Matthew, Thursday and Fridays on the Apostolic Letters, and Saturday evenings on John's Gospel. No one man carried this entire load. There was a staff of preachers, but Luther's share alone was prodigious. If you include family devotions, he often spoke four times on Sundays and quarterly undertook a two-week series, four days a week, to go through the catechism. The sum of his extant sermons is 2,300. The highest count is for the year 1528, for which there are 195 sermons distributed over 145 days. He was a hard-working man. John Calvin at Saint-Pierre in Geneva preached almost 4,000 sermons. Heinrich Bullinger, who succeeded Zwingli in Zurich, preached there for 43 years, going serially through the Bible, daily for his first six years, and then on Sundays and two weekdays thereafter. And today, if you were to go, if you were to, go to the Zurich Public Library, you would find drafts and transcriptions of around 6,000 of Bullinger's sermons. Ludwig Lavater of the church in Zurich wrote in 1559, the holy books are not set forth after being torn and mangled, but are explained in their entirety, one right after another. Brother Preacher, I don't know how you do this. I'll tell you what I do and what I've done since I came to Capitol Hill in 1994. I just think of the different genre of scripture. So I, I would divide up into seven basic groups. Uh, as, you, as you would look at it, just going in order, you've got the law, you've got the books of history, you've got the writings, you've got the prophets. And in the New Testament, you've got the gospel and Acts, you've got Paul's letters and the other letters. And what I've done since I got there is just literally gone back and forth from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's law, gospel, books of history, Paul's letters, writings, prophet, I mean, uh, letter, uh, other letters, prophets, gospels, law. So I just, I've been alternating like that for 23 years. That's just what I do. I just go back and forth. That's what God leads me to do. To use Southern Baptist parlance, God leads me to do that. You know, I go back and forth in his inspired word from the Old Testament to the New Testament, teaching God's people God's word. Uh, that is edifying to the church. It is, it is edifying to my own soul. I hear preachers sometimes say like, ah, oh, I've been doing it a long time. I feel like I'm running out of stuff to say. I cannot even imagine that. I, I, I feel like I've got, I've got more now that I'm seeing than, than I've ever seen. I, I, I cannot imagine running out of things to preach. Uh, the Bible is inexhaustible. I remember when I was a kid seeing a, a, a movie about um, the structure of the universe and called Powers of Ten, where it shows a, a couple laying on a blanket in a Chicago park, and then it starts going out by Powers of Ten. And all of a sudden you see the whole park, and then you see Chicago, and then you see Lake Michigan in the Midwest, and then you see North America, and then you see the globe, and then as it keeps going out by powers of 10, soon the moon goes by, and it keeps going further out, you see planets, and then it's outside the solar system, and it keeps going, and then at some point they stop and they come back in by powers of 10 till you're back at the couple laying there on the blanket in the park. And then all of a sudden when you think the movie's done, it zooms into the, man, the back of the man's hand, and then it starts going in by powers of 10 looking at the cellular structure, smaller and smaller components, magnifying it, and then again back out. Well, all of that is just a, a long illustration to say that I think there's good we get and at just about every level we want to look at the Bible carefully. 
You can look at the Bible verse by verse. You can look at it chapter by chapter. You can look at it book by book, testament by testament. You can look at it uh, phrase by phrase and word by word. Uh, There is good to be gotten at every level. Now, the most natural level varies. Uh, I think we'd say generally it's a paragraph. Uh, It's difficult, but there's an advantage of using just one verse at a time or even one phrase. Many of you know Matthew Henry's commentary. His father, Philip Henry, was a minister. He preached 40 sermons on Colossians 3.11. Christ is all and is in all. 40 sermons. Samuel Medley, who in the late 18th century was pastor of the Baptist Church in Liverpool, England, often preached sermons on just one word from a text. Joseph Carroll, a Congregationalist who was at the Westminster Assembly, preached at St. Magnus the Martyr Church near London Bridge. He preached 424 sermons on Job. He began in 1643 and ended almost 24 years later in 1666, averaging 10 sermons per chapter. Now, to be fair, Carroll didn't only preach from Job to his church during those years. He merely often did so. He thought that it was particularly relevant for their times. And in the final sermon, he apologizes, saying, quote, I have not attained so clear an understanding of some passages, close quote. And I believe those sermons are currently in print in 10 volumes. It's actually been called the crown jewel of Puritan preaching. In 1739, Jonathan Edwards preached a series of 30 sermons on Isaiah 51, verse 8. Now, friends, there's a difficulty of doing that well. There's also a difficulty of doing overview sermons, one sermon of a whole book. I found this method of preaching really through discipling. Uh, I was in my last year in England as a graduate student, and a Muslim friend from Pakistan came to Christ. I didn't lead him to Christ. I knew him, uh, but someone asked me if I would disciple him. Uh, I was headed back to America to go be the pastor of this church in Washington, and I just had about three or four months left. But uh, I, I said, yeah. So I met up with my friend's name was Shazad. I met up with him, and I said, listen, you know, you're a Muslim ba- background. I, I don't assume you understand atonement. So why don't, why don't we study the book of Hebrews? And the way we'd like us, I'd like us to do this is I'd like you to teach me the book of Hebrews. So we'll meet three times, and I want you to cover a third of the book each time. Uh, I don't really care if you can tell me what you know, chapter and verse something is. I want you to know the argument of Hebrews. So when we get together, I will read a phrase or a sentence, and I want you to tell me where it is. Again, I don't care if you tell me it's chapter 2, verse 4. Those are medieval inventions that are useful, but that's, that's not inspired. I want you to tell me where it is in the argument. Oh, yeah, that's the second example the writer is giving of how Jesus is greater. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than the angels. That's from the angels section. That's when he's saying this. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to tell me what it is. So it was very useful for me. So when I got to CHBC, one of the things I wanted to do was come up with a way to give the burden of a book in a single message. So uh, newest preacher and, and longest time preacher, that's what we gave you, copies of those overview sermons that I did from the New Testament and from the Old Testament. Those were sermons that I preached at my church uh, back when when I first got there. And I remember it was just wonderful. I felt like I was walking through trails in a park that were rarely walked on, getting great views. You know, it's one thing to be in a a 25-week series, you know, in Isaiah. It's another thing to try to read through Isaiah, you know, all at once and to give its weight and balance in a single sermon. Uh, so those were the most difficult sermons I've ever preached, but they're incredibly fruitful for my own soul. So just to take the major prophets as an example, I did that as a series. So I didn't do 66 weeks of overview sermons in a row. I would do genre. So I would do like the, the, the major prophets. It was a four week series. I called it big hopes, major prophets, big hopes. Anyway, um, you know, message of Isaiah, message of Jeremiah, message of Ezekiel, message of Daniel. And they're, they're beautiful. I love classical music. It's, it's like four movements in a symphony. You know, you've got Isaiah, which has everything in it. Uh, You know, you you have the condemnation of the nations. You have the extraordinary siege and salvation of Jerusalem right at the very middle of the book, chapters 36, 37. God's amazing deliverance. And then you have the, the marvelous salvation and just on into the beautiful 52, 53, and ultimately, you know, 60 to 66. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it just has, has everything. All the themes are there ahead of time. Uh, and then you get 
Jeremiah, well, how different is that? You've now gone forward, you know, a hundred years or more, and now it's the time of the Babylonian captivity, and Jeremiah's actually been left in Jerusalem. It's in ruins. Things are terrible. He's called the weeping prophet for a reason. It's very, um, it's very caustic. It's, it's sharp. It's filled with pain, and Jeremiah grasping for hope. Uh, and then you get Ezekiel, which is the same time as Jeremiah, only Ezekiel had been carried out of Jerusalem. So he's over in Babylon getting, as it were, these sort of TV broadcasts from the Lord about what's going on back in Jerusalem that Jeremiah is experiencing. Ezekiel is being told the significance of it. And, uh, and Ezekiel, I think, is one of the most underappreciated books by evangelical preachers. Oh, brothers, why you don't preach Ezekiel more? I do not understand. It is an absolutely glorious book. You know, from that initial vision of God, which climaxes even with the amazing scene in his voice speaking, to the heart-rending section in those first few chapters, where in verses 4, 5, 6, 7, the, 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 the Spirit of God is depicted as leaving the temple and leaving Jerusalem, looking back and then leaving. Oh, it, ju- it just shows you what the, what the exile was. Uh, and then many famous passages in Ezekiel, I think we get confused often, we avoid it because we don't want to deal with those last eight chapters, you know, 40 to 48, where he has this vision of the, the heavenly temple with this fantastic comic book size, you know, so many thousands of miles by so many thousands of si- miles by so many, so many thousands of miles, what does this even mean? And, and we just get confused and it goes into all the details of the temple. But friends, I think when that was preached, if you imagine the people... St- in exile in Babylon, listening to this long description of the temple, uh, what that's going to mean is these people could remember the temple in Jerusalem, unlike you and me. So all these details, their loving memories are being evoked. And of course, the temple showed God's presence with his people. And what the people of Israel feared was that in losing their land, they had lost their Lord. So when all of a sudden they get the prophet of God saying to them, giving them this vision of the temple of God coming to them, then they begin to understand that God is going to remain with them, that He is their people. He is their God and they are His people. And so the last line of the book is, the name of the city is, the Lord is there. Oh, is that not incredibly sweet to the people in your church who've just had a rough week? who feel like God has abandoned them, who feel like their sins have separated them from their Savior. Oh, brothers, go to the book of Ezekiel or the book of Daniel where you have this one individual also with Ezekiel carried out as an exile. And then Daniel has these amazing interactions with Nebuchadnezzar and then these dreams toward the end where you get this clear hope of the resurrection of the body. And then Daniel 7, the son of man, this one that looks like a man but receives the worship of God. Uh, So anyway, friends, that's just for familiarize your church with those four books. Imagine if the people in your church knew if a problem was going on, they didn't need to reach for a book by, you know, Paul Tripp or Don Whitney or John Piper, but they knew, hey, this is what James is about. Oh, Jeremiah is about this. Nehemiah is great for this. Second Corinthians talks about this real clearly. What if they knew the books of the Bible so they could go for those books? I don't mind you going for other books. I I write other books, but... But the books of the Bible are better. And if our people can get to know the books of the Bible, if God uses us to help them to get to know these 66 books, what a precious role he's given us in serving them that we could help teach them the word of God like this. Just practically what I try to do, I I plan for a year. Uh, I'll sit down and try to work out my preaching. I'll I'll figure out how many Sundays I've got of where I am in my current series, how much longer I think I need to do it. And then <clears throat> we literally uh, print out a card that we put in all the pews. We have copies for visitors to take uh, that shows you every sermon that's coming up. Um, shows you, uh, like, so coming up, we've got, um, I did a two-part series in Haggai uh, last month. Uh, Ligon Duncan was with us and did a, a one-off from Ephesians. Uh, Blake Boylson, who's right here, uh, uh, did um, a, uh, is doing a two-part series in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, I'm in a longer series in Romans chapter 3. And then while I'm gone, like on this trip, Bobby Jameson is doing a series through Exodus. Uh, 
So you can see every Sunday what's coming up. Now, Blake, if you want to grab a couple of guys, maybe one for each section, could you help pass something out? And can I have one of those? Um, Blake is going to pass out, thanks. Blake is going to pass out a church card because <clears throat> one question uh, that we often get, and the more you guys can multiply those, the faster they'll be passed out. Um, yeah, just take one, pass it down. Some people say, hey, Mark, it's a cool idea to do the church card, the sermon card like this. I'll tell you the main reason we do this, because I want people to be able to study God's word before they come to church. So in my own personal quiet times, what I do every day of my life, I may read more than this, but I will at least read what I'm going to hear preached on coming up this coming Lord's Day. So that I'm getting my soul kind of chewed up and ready so that when Lig's going to preach to me from Ephesians, I've been reading that part of Ephesians every day. I've been praying. I'm getting ready so that when I come to the sermon, I'm hungry, whether or not I'm the preacher or somebody else is the preacher. So that means, yes, even when I go on vacation with my family, I would try to figure out where we're going to go to church on Sunday morning. And if it's on their website, I would call that pastor to find out what he's going to be preaching on that day so that I could be using that in my quiet time every day that week. We teach the members of our congregation to do this. We say, whatever else you do, read the passage of Scripture. So every week, or every day this week, the people who are going to be at our church on Sunday morning, Lord willing, will be reading Exodus chapters 1 and 2. Uh, so that's the verses we have coming up for this week, Exodus chapters 1 and 2. doesn't matter who the preacher is, do the work of preparing your soul with God's Word. Teach your congregation to do this. Now, the objection I always get about this is why I'm giving you this pass out, this handout right now. The objection I always get is, but Mark, if you say ahead of time what you're going to do, what do you do if something bad happens? What if disaster strikes? To which I respond, the Holy Spirit is not trapped into only leading us spontaneously. The Holy Spirit can lead us whenever he wants to. So here's the sermon card that we had planned when 9-11 happened. I had no advance notice from Al-Qaeda. We had, we had passed this out uh, in, uh, on Labor Day weekend. So we had these in the pews, Labor Day weekend, September the 2nd in 2001. We had planned these in August, sent them to the printer. So, and here's what we had planned. We were in a two-part series on Habakkuk, when bad things happen. September the 9th, the Sunday before, it was happened on a Tuesday, was questions. September the 16th was confidence. And then we went into eight studies on the Psalms, the quest for peace, for justice, for security. Who knew what a buzzword that was about to become? For forgiveness, for salvation, for mercy, for holiness, for wisdom. Uh, you can skip the little series of Al Mohler on sex. Um, then uh, what the future holds, five studies in Revelation, the man who saw the future, a throne, a lamb, a storm, a city, and then who holds the future, two studies in Isaiah, the sovereign God, the God of judgment and mercy. Brother preacher, our congregation could not have been better pre prepared had we known what was going to happen. Prepare as best you can and trust the Lord will use what you've prepared. Just a little encouragement for you, then I'll have done. Ian Murray says, the recovery and revival of the church after periods of declension always begins in the ministry of the Word. Again, if you are a regular preacher of the Word, I hope in this first hour together, I have hope, I've tried to give you a little encouragement for perseverance. Preach. Preach the Word. God uses your preaching. God uses your preaching sometimes a long time after you preach it. Here's an email I got last year from a friend at church. Hey, brother. Happy New Year. I am currently teaching a Sunday school class on the ABCs of Reformed Theology. Now, I remind you, I, I got this email last year. And I just wanted to let you know how much your sermon on election delivered on March 2nd, 2003 from Romans 9 changed my life. At the time, I had no clue what semi-Pelagianism or Arminianism was, but I likely was scarred with their brands. I remembered sitting in about the 10th pew on the right side of the main hall, maybe right behind Jason Townsend, who likely would have been translating your sermon into Spanish for his mother-in-law. 
I remember my temperature starting to rise as the sermon progressed. And then a sense of calm. Then the light came on. And what you were saying finally exposed the poor teaching I had tolerated growing up and revealed God as the sovereign creator that he is. What's more, from that point, I could start to understand better how the different persons of the Trinity worked toward the covenants of redemption, works, and grace. It all started to make sense. And by God's grace, I now find great comfort in all the doctrines of grace, including unconditional sovereign election. I listen again this morning to that sermon with a pit in my stomach and occasionally watery eyes. The Spirit was really at work that day. I was thinking this morning, we were about to go to war in Iraq, and God was equipping soldiers in his army from Romans 9. Thanks for equipping us. Friend, you see how important preaching is? It makes a difference in your people's lives. If you haven't read Jonathan Lehman's excellent little book, Word-Centered Church, he gives you some good examples. The book has big print. Word-Centered Church. Jonathan Lehman gives good examples of how expositional preaching permeates and shapes a congregation. Uh, preaching is important, friends, because the people we preach to are so important. John Welsh, the son-in-law of the famous John Knox, often left his bed in the middle of the night, wrapped himself in a warm plaid, and interceded for the people in his church. When his wife would beg him to go back to sleep, he would say, I have the souls of 3,000 to answer for, and I know not how it is with many of them. Brothers, I fear today that if you've got 100 people at your church this week, and you have 120 next week, and 140 the next week, you'll be happy. And you won't care what happened to the 100 the first week, so long as you have 20 more the next week, and 20 more the week after that. I would like to challenge you to realize that's an unfaithful shepherd attitude. No, what you care about are those hundred people who came. And the week after that, it's not just that the total, if you count every nose, is gone up by 20. You want to know where were the hundred people who were here last week? How, are, how is it with them? Brothers, don't despair. What you see today is the fruit of your preaching will not be all that there is of it. Sometimes the seed may lie under the earth until we do and then spring up. I love the example of Luke Short's conversion. John Flavel's preaching was blessed by the Spirit. Robert Murray McShane tells about an American immigrant, Luke Short, who remembered listening to Flavel preach in England when he was 15 years old. The text was 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Eighty-five years after hearing Flavel preach, on the horror of dying under God's curse, the Spirit of God effectually converted him at the age of 100 as he recalled that sermon he'd heard as a boy in England. Praise God for His Word. He uses His Word. I pray that these couple of days together will encourage us. Pray that they will help us to help our churches by encouraging us to preach God's Word. Let's pray that God do that now. Let's pray. Lord God, we do want to pray specifically that you will open to us the glories of your Word. Lord, we thank you supremely for the gloriously empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Thank you that he is raised, that you desire to spread his glory among the nations, and that you do this by your Spirit through your Word. Lord, when all around us tell us how unimportant what we as preachers of your word do, how unimportant it is, help us not to believe them. Help us to believe you in your word. Give us encouragement from our churches, from our own reading of your word, for our knowledge of your word's effect in our own lives. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us. Bless your churches. Convert the lost, we pray. Bring the nations to Christ. We ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.